Hey there, it's Michelle Caruana from Play Cafe Academy and Profitable Play, and I have another guest expert interview for you today. And you'll probably notice if you've been following my channel for a while that I've been doing a lot more of these guest expert interviews lately, and that is by design. I really set a goal for myself in 2024 and beyond really to finally tackle some of those topics that I get asked about all the time, but I've never really dove into because they were outside of my wheelhouse or you know my area of expertise, if you will. And this is gonna be one of those videos. So in this guest expert interview, I am welcoming Elon Page, who is the host of the Homeschool Our Way podcast. And I wanted to talk to Elon because she has a really unique perspective on how we as place space owners can best serve the homeschool community because not only is she a homeschooling parent and not only is she the host of a homeschooling podcast, but she's also taken my Play Cafe Academy course and she is a member of Playmaker Society. So again, she's kind of been on both sides of the equation, both as someone who has planned to open a play space and as somebody who, again, homeschools her children and is very connected in her local homeschool community. So in this guest expert interview, Elon and I are going to talk about things like what she looks for in an indoor play space when she's looking to really enhance that homeschooling experience, what classes and programs she looks for and how she decides if the benefit is worth the cost. She's going to talk about what stands out most to her in a play space as a homeschooling family. She's going to talk about ways that we as business owners can really connect with homeschooling families and market to them in a way that doesn't feel you know, icky or overly salesy. And then finally, she's going to address some specific concerns that we as business owners need to be aware of regarding serving homeschooling families of color. So if you have any questions or want follow-up information from Elon, her podcast and all of her information is linked in the video description. But I'm really excited about this video because I know that so many of you watching are really interested in catering to the homeschool families in your area, but are maybe just not as intimately familiar with that community as Elon is. So I learned a lot in this interview, including some big misconceptions that indoor play space owners like myself hold when it comes to homeschooling families. And again, it was just so insightful. So I'm really excited to bring you this guest expert interview. All right, without further ado, here is my conversation with Elon Page, the host of the Homeschool Our Way podcast. Hi, Elon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, it's good to be here. Thank you, Michelle. I'm really excited to speak with you today. So before we dive in, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and let everyone know what we're here to talk about today? Absolutely. So my name is Elon Page, and I am a homeschooling mom of two. I have two girls, ages six and nine. And I actually, now I have a brand called Homeschool Our Way, where I help families of color get started in this homeschool life. I love that. And today we're kind of taking a spin on that topic. And I reached out to you because we've been in the same community for a while, but something that I'm interested in and something that I know a lot of people are interested in who own play spaces or who are interested in owning play spaces is how we can better accommodate the homeschooling community. So I'm assuming you have a little bit of experience bringing your kids out and about and trying to incorporate education in that? Yes. No, absolutely. I One thing about homeschool families, and it's not specific just to me, is that we are always looking for opportunities for socialization and opportunities for learning. So taking our kids out and about and getting them out and about is, is really a part of it. All right. Awesome. So let's kind of dive in. So we're going to get more into the details, but off the top of your head, what are some things that we as play space owners should keep in mind if homeschooling families are one of the groups that we'd like to accommodate? Well, I, for one thing, I think it's important to, it's very powerful to speak directly to your audience, right? So it's one thing to have, there are some businesses, my, my kids are actually headed to, um, to their gymnastics place today because they have an open gym in the middle of the day. But what is missing from their marketing is homeschool families or something that said that shouts out and says, Hey, this is for you. So I would definitely tell, I would definitely tell, um, play place owners. It's important to, to make sure that you're speaking directly to your audience. So when you're looking for that type of marketing, are there any other than the obvious, which is, you know, homeschooling families. So maybe they could call it, you know, 
homeschool family gymnastic meetup or something like that. But are there any other like words or phrases that kind of jump out to you that tell you, yes, this is something that we would be interested in? Yeah. So again, we're always, we as homeschool families are always looking for opportunities for learning and opportunities for social socialization. So I would say if there is a learning component, um, if there's, even if it's, if it's, you know, if it's imaginative play, that's learning, right? That's learning through play. So you want to make sure that you call out those elements. And then you also want to make sure that you are calling out the fact that, Hey, you can meet other homeschool families. You can come and you can, you know, especially like for those of us who are new, maybe to a city, or maybe we've just started homeschooling. We start out being like, okay, so we know we're here, but like, where's everybody else? We want to meet other families. We want, I want my kids to have folks to play with. I, as a parent, want to have people to connect with. And so we're always looking again for opportunities to connect with other homeschool families. So you definitely want to make sure that you call that out as well. So, and this is probably just my curiosity, but when you're, because I'm, I'm, I don't have a lot of experience with homeschooling other than what we did during the pandemic which was obviously a little bit out of the ordinary, but when you are looking for homeschooling activities, do you like to see it separated by age or are more of the homeschooling families facing, you know, situations where they have maybe a two-year-old and a five-year-old and a nine-year-old and they all need to do the same activity? Can you kind of talk a little bit about how you approach finding activities for multiple ages or do you like to see them separated by age? Okay. So I'm going to say this, this kind of depends <clears throat> and here's why for play purposes. Now, of course you always want to make sure that you're being safe, right? You don't want toddlers, you know, around 10 year olds that are going to run them over, but for play purposes, I, my, my nine-year-old loves to play with little kids. She has this heart where she loves um, she just loves to lead and she loves to be involved with the little, with the, with the, with the younger kids. And so for her going to a playground and, and playing with a three-year-old, no big deal. So I wouldn't stress about the, the play situation. I think that everybody, again, safety, notwithstanding, I think that everybody can kind of play together from a learning standpoint. This is interesting. What I've started to see is that Yes, in traditional school, we separate by age, right? Like, so all the first graders are together, all the second graders are together and so on. But from a learning standpoint, it doesn't have to be so rigid. So I would say keep, keep maybe a group of kids together. So I would say maybe like kids from three to seven, they can kind of be together or kids from, you know, eight to 13, something like that but it doesn't have to be so specific in terms of like all the five-year-olds, all the six-year-olds are together, that kind of thing. Because what happens is the younger kids learn from the older kids and the older kids are able to lead um, with the younger kids. And so everybody's kind of getting something out of it. Absolutely. And I think that's a really good point. So it doesn't necessarily have to be divided by age level, because I think a lot of play space owners have that misconception that, oh, you know, nobody's going to sign up because I don't have the capacity to offer, you know, a first grade cooking class or something like that, or, you know, have all of the different levels divided. So I think that is such a great point. So when you're evaluating a program at a play space, so again, let's just say it's a, let's say it's a music class, just for example sake. What are some things that you might look for other than the homeschooling label or the so socialization when you are evaluating if it's going to be something that will actually benefit your family specifically? Well, so I'm glad you I'm glad you brought up the classes piece because I think this is definitely an opportunity for our play space owners is to offer these specific classes. Um, you, you mentioned music, which I think is a good one. I do want to point out this. As a homeschool parent, it the the heavy lift of the education part is on me, right? And so I, when I'm looking for opportunities, when I'm looking for outside learning opportunities, I'm not so much looking for the very uh, strict, very traditional like curriculum type learning opportunities. I'm looking for something that's supplemental to what we're already doing at home. So, for example. I might, we might be learning 
the, the structure and the phonics of say maybe Spanish at home, but I want something, teach, teach my kids some songs, you know, let them, let them kind of talk with other students and that kind of thing. You don't necessarily have to find learning opportunities to bring into your play space that are like, think outside of the traditional school box. It doesn't have to be everybody sitting down at a desk and learning. That's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for the things that as homeschool families, we're looking for the things that we can't necessarily offer at home. And a lot of times, again, that's the interaction with the other kids. That's the, that's the fun part. Like we want to, we want to be able to supplement with, with these fun opportunities. Awesome. So, and that kind of relieves a little bit of the pressure off of us as play space owners, because I think, again, a big misconception I hear all the time when I ask, you know, what are some reasons that you don't specifically target the homeschool community as they say, we can't afford to hire a teacher or we, you know, can't accommodate this specific curriculum. So it's great to hear that you're looking for those kind of peripheral supplemental activities. Absolutely. So I've seen a bunch of play space owners because I had to do a little bit of research before this episode or before this interview. I noticed that a lot of play space owners will have their party room kind of as a homeschooling room that people can rent out or utilize during the day. Is that something that you ever look for? Or do you feel more comfortable, again, like you said, covering the curriculum aspect or at least the heavy lifting of the education portion at home? Is this something that we should maybe steer away from and use that room in a different way? I think it depends on what you're offering. So what I, what I find is that with, with the younger kids, so we're going to say like, maybe like six and under a lot of times they sitting at a, sitting at a table in a room is not going to bring out the best in them. It's not going to bring out the, the most creative um, parts of them. And so they might need to be closer to the action, you know, in terms of like where your, where your actual play areas are. Um, even if it is, they're sitting in a circle, they're sitting in a circle on the floor, but they're surrounded by the rest of your play area. They're far enough away to where they're not tempted to, you know, go over and pick up a toy or, you know, do whatever, but they're in a more creative environment than perhaps the party room can offer because it's tables and chairs for the most part. Um, but as we move into say, maybe older kids, I'm going to give an example of a specific type of class. There's, there's something called pewter bugs. It is actually a coding class for kids. And so what happens is the instructor comes in and the instructor has different, um, like iPad type, you know, tablets or whatever that the kids are working on. Now that kind of a class obviously probably is going to be better if the kids are sitting at a table, um, just so that they can, they just have the proper, you know, kind of setup to be able to do what they're doing on the tablets and that kind of thing. So I would say it depends on the class, but it also depends on the age level because the younger the kids, the more that you want to make sure that play is truly incorporated into what they're, into what they're learning. Absolutely. So I'm so glad that you shared that. And we kind of talked about what you look for when you are signing up for a class or doing some research. Is there anything that kind of steers you away or turns you off as a homeschooling parent when you're evaluating these different programs or just so socialization opportunities? Cost has to be, cost has to be a thing. And I realize that, you know, money makes the world go around and we can't, we can't just be out here giving our, our services away for free. But what happens with homeschool parents, and I am guilty, 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 I tend to want to sign my kids up for everything that I see. And so what happens is that adds up very quickly. And so you want to make sure that especially beginnings of the year type times, so your Januaries and your maybe like August and Septembers when the, when the school year begins, you want to make sure that you have your offerings out there and that you're talking about them in such a way that you're like, this is affordable enough to be able to put right into your overall curriculum, homeschool families. Um, it's an opportunity that you can do in addition to all the other things that you have to pay for. So you just want to be mindful that the, whatever classes or whatever, you know, membership or whatever it is that they're getting from you, it's probably not the only thing that they're paying for. We, as homeschool families, again, we tend to purchase a lot of different opportunities. So just, just have that cost um, piece in mind. 
Awesome. So I know a lot of play spaces are interested in creating these offers, or let's talk about membership specifically for homeschooling families. So we talked about, you know, one-off classes or packs of classes and things like that, but is there something that in an unlimited membership that a play space were to offer, is there something that you would point to and say, yes, this is exactly what I need? Like, for example, really flexible hours or something like that? I'm so glad you brought up that the flexible hours, because that's one thing that is sometimes hard to find. You wouldn't think that it is, but it is hard to find sometimes is these kinds of play opportunities that are open during the day. We as homeschool parents, by the time we're hitting five, six o'clock in the evening, we're done. Like we're so done. <laughs> and so we really want to have these kinds of opportunities Monday through Friday, like during the day. And I know for my kiddos and, you know, Michelle, I know that you live in, in upstate New York. And so there's snow on the ground for however many months, you know, during the year. And for us, we're in Texas. And so it's the opposite. It's too doggone hot to go outside for, you know, for several months of the year. And so what happens is that I'm looking for opportunities all the time for my kids just to even get PE, right? Just to even get their, their physical exercise. And so if you offer, if your play space is one that offers gross motor skill opportunities for kids to run and jump and play and, you know, work off their energy, I would definitely suggest number one, being open, even if it's just for a couple hours during the day, and you can even call it again, you know, we talked about like, um, giving it a name, homeschool PE or homeschool play or something to that effect. So that, so that parents really know oh, okay, this is how I can, this is how I can plug, or this is how I can fill this that's missing that we're not able to do at home. And the other piece is, so I'm a working mom. And so yes, I work. And yes, I, I homeschool my kids. And sometimes I have to do all the things at the same time. <laughs> and so what I love about Michelle, what you teach is have a coffee shop that is a part of your play space. And the reason why this is super important for, um, for homeschool parents, especially those of us who work is the fact that when my kids need that exercise, when my kids need that socialization outlet, I can accompany them, but I'm not losing time from work necessarily. I can perhaps still sit and have my coffee and, um, and allow them to play and do what they want to do, but I'm still in the facility with them. And so nobody's really losing out. I hate the days that I'm, I'm tied to my computer and my kids are like, oh my gosh, can we go out and play? And I'm just like, yeah, you can go in the backyard, but that's about as far as you can go because mommy can't get away. So, um, so definitely don't forget about the, the working parents and the things that you can do to make sure that all members of the family are accommodated. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that's another big misconception that play space owners have, because again, a lot of us don't have experience homeschooling. They assume that during the day, these homeschooling parents need or want to be fully engaged with their kids when they come. Whereas realistically, they're fully engaged with their kids all day long. So they all might the time. <laughs> utilize this play space as an opportunity to get other things accomplished, whether that's work or whether that's meal planning or paying bills. So I'm so glad you brought that up because again, I think when we think of like the stereotypical homeschooling family, again, they're bringing their, their books and their textbooks to the play space and they have to be, you know, they have a checklist of things they have to accomplish, but that's not reality, especially for these homeschooling parents that work. So as, you know, as somebody who does need to accomplish these other things and utilize play spaces for things like PE, social, socialization, are there, is there like a perfect environment for you? So for example, I know for me, it's, you know, there needs to be a lot of outlets. There needs to be like comfortable seating. Is, is, is there anything that you look for when you're looking for that, that ideal environment where your kids can play and you can get stuff done? You're already speaking my language with the, with the outlets. I was at a, just a coffee shop the other day and could not find an outlet. And I was like, what kind of world is this that we live in? I need to be able to plug up. So that's super important. It's very practical. Um, keep the coffee flowing. That's always good. And then snacks too, because sometimes, you know, you don't necessarily want to leave when the kids get hungry or when you get hungry, 
but, um, but we don't always pack the snacks, even though we know we should. <laughs> so that's always, um, that's always good to have as an option to purchase. I also think if there's a way and there's not, there's always not, I'm not going to say that there's, um, that each play space is created equally, but if there's a way to give some level of separation between your cafe and your play area so that it truly feels separate, right? Like, so, so I guess what I'm saying is the kids, not that your kids can't run up to you and, you know, ask you a question, mommy, look, I'm doing a backflip or, you know, whatever, but that the kids aren't necessarily always hang you're that the kids aren't always necessarily hanging out in the cafe area. Um, that that is not just an extension of the play area. Now, again, space wise, everybody can't always accommodate that, but that is always kind of a nice thing to have where I really, I truly, as a mom, I truly can feel like, okay, I'm sitting over here and I'm doing me and you're over in the play area and you're doing you. And I can still have an eye on you. I can still check on you. You still have access to me, but we don't necessarily have to be occupying the same space. That's always helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I keep saying this, but I think this is another misconception that a lot of play space owners have is they feel like if they create that separation, that the play area needs to be supervised because a lot of times we're accommodating very young children during the day. But as you mentioned earlier, if that's an add-on option and that's not included in the base price, that's probably not something that homeschool families are going to want or necessarily be able to prioritize because as you said, you have a six and a nine-year-old. So they don't necessarily need a babysitter if you're still in eyesight, if they still have access to you, if they need something or are going to the bathroom. So I know for me, I like having the option because for me, it really depends on the day. Someday my kids, some days my kids are really needy and I need to be like in the play area with them, even if I have to accomplish something, but some days they're a little bit more independent, or maybe I'm on a deadline and I have to be a little bit more, you know, heads down with whatever I'm working on. So I think you brought up a lot of great points about having that separation, but not making it impossible for them to access you. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that I'm really curious about, because I think a lot of us are interested in accommodating homeschool families and the points you brought up about the marketing and making sure it's a good fit and cost effective. I think we're all brilliant, but are there ways that you would suggest that we as play space owners connect with homeschool families? So are there groups, organizations, or, you know, is there any agency that you work with maybe to find these opportunities? How can we reach homeschooling families? So this is right up my alley because, um, I, I love connecting with people. <laughs> so I'm happy to give these kinds of tips. So the first thing, the first thing is that I'm going to lead with is, um, again, having a homeschool time, a designated time during the day where families just call it homeschool, right. And the families will find you, they will come to you again. This is important for families who are not maybe already connected in who don't know other homeschool families, um, they'll come just to meet people. And so that's, that's always a good thing. The other thing though, is there's something called homeschool co-ops. These are groups that where it's just as the name suggests, these are co-op groups where there are families that, um, that come together. And a lot of times they come together for different purposes. So there might be a co-op specifically for field trips. There might be a co-op specifically for, offering classes. Um, there might even be just a, a co-op specifically for social socialization and, and play and that kind of thing. All three though, of those are opportunities that can happen at a play space. And so what you'll want to do, one of the ways to find co-ops is let's start on Facebook, Facebook, a lot of times in the, the, the group function is so powerful for, for this kind of thing. So you can search co-ops, of course, that are in your area. So you literally can just type in homeschool co-ops in, I'm in Dallas, Texas, homeschool co-ops in Dallas, Texas, and I can find the ones that are near me. Now you can reach out to them. Um, you can reach out to them individually, 
You can also though, a lot of times they're open groups there. A lot of times they function the, the Facebook groups, they function as just kind of parent groups, right? Like parent groups where we can go in and just kind of share resources and that kind of thing. And so as an individual, you can be a part of one of those groups don't go in just selling your stuff, right? Like, but you want to just kind of sit back and listen to the conversations. So a, a few things, a few ways that this could be helpful to play space owners is number one, you can listen to what they need and what they're looking for. Um, if somebody says, Hey, does anybody know of a space where, you know, so-and-so and such and such, and you can either reach out to that person directly, or you can say, just as an individual, oh yes, I know there's a spot called so and so, and you can you can name drop your own your own business. Um, the other thing though is with the co-ops, they like I said, they have different functions, right? And so for the for the co-ops who offer classes, or for the co-ops who offer um, socialization or um, meetups, that kind of thing, again, right there in the name, they're looking for places to meet up. And for the classes, sometimes um, if you have, you know, if you have a party room, right, and you have your play space, the kids can have their classes in your party room, and then they can, um, and then they can play afterward in your play space. And my, we go to a, a, a homeschool co-op on Mondays that is actually, that's just that. It doesn't take place at an indoor play space, but it does take place somewhere where there's an indoor facility where we have our classes. And then afterward, we can, it's at a nature preserve actually. And then afterward we can go out, there's a playground outside. So as long as the weather is good, we can go outside, we can have our lunch outside and the kids can play. And so the same thing can happen at your play space if you make these connections with these co-ops. So I would, I would highly suggest reaching out and just saying, hey, I offer this, let's like, let's sit down and talk. Let's, you know, invite them into your space you know, give them a cup of coffee and say, tell me what your needs are. Tell me how we can work together so that I can help you. And then you guys can come in and be able to experience my space. That's awesome. Yeah. It looks like there's, or it sounds like there's a lot of really cool opportunities where we can combine, you know, classes and play. And that could be a really cool way to combine a couple different offerings to create a very personalized homeschool membership, maybe for that co-op or that is fitted to the specific needs of the homeschooling families in our own areas. Absolutely. And I, I'm sorry, I want to um, mention one more thing. I know that a lot of times we talk about field trips with regard to traditional schools, but don't forget about um, homeschool field trips. My kiddos go on a field trip once a week. And so field trips, because in the, in the homeschool world, we have more flexibility. There's so many, there's so much more red tape and that kind of thing that has to happen in traditional schools. And so you might only have an opportunity for the kids to do a, um, a field trip, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, if they're lucky, but homeschool field trips are much more fre frequent. And so, um, so definitely offer up your facility as a place where homeschool field trips can, can happen. And again, even if it's just this particular co-op, is doing a field trip to your, to your facility, maybe once a month, something like that. It's something that the kids will look forward to and it's, and it's a nice change of pace. So, um, so that's an opportunity as well. That's a really good point. So are, is there anything that we left out, any opportunities that we as play space owners can, I, I really want to hone in, I think on the socialization, are there any other opportunities that we can take advantage of to really empower homeschool families to engage in the socialization? Are there any, are there any examples of classes that you found that have been really helpful or any play spaces that you think are doing this really well? I actually want to shout out one of my, um, one of my fellow Playmaker Society um, members, Alira Owens. She has a, um, she has a play space here. Um, I'm forgetting the name of it. Do you remember the name of it, Michelle? Project Play. Thank you. Project Play. It's in North Texas. And like I said, I'm in Dallas. And so um, so that's right here in my area. And what's very cool about what she offers is that um, she has what's called a discovery school. And so families can sign up for this discovery school and twice a week, their kiddos can come in and it's a drop-off situation, right? So, um, and this is, I think it's from ages like two to six and she has them, she does have them broken off just a little bit um, within that. But 
what is able to happen is that the parents are able to drop off and the kids are able to do a half day right there at, um, at her play space. And it's led by a teacher. There's a curriculum, it's play-based, um, it's STEM inspired. And so it has all of the things from a learning standpoint and from a socialization standpoint that, um, that you, that you, that you'd like, you know, with traditional school, the kids coming together and being able to interact with one another, that kind of thing. Um, and then also it gives the parents a little bit of time, you know, because they're able to drop off for that half a day, but it's only two days a week. And so what I love about that also is that that as homeschool families, again, we do the heavy lifting of the teaching and the curriculum and so forth at home. And so I still, as a homeschool parent, I still want time to be able to teach my kids at home. I don't necessarily need to send them somewhere five days a week, but this two day a week um, discovery school that Alara has set up, I think is a fantastic blend of the two, of the two ways of, of doing things. And what was very cool. So I actually coached um, a woman several months ago before the school year started, she was just getting started in, in homeschool. And she told me, she was like, well, yeah, she was like, well, my son, he's going to be able to go to this, um, this school. And, and I was like, oh, well, send me the name of it. Cause this is cool. You know what, it, what it sounds like. And when she sent it to me, it's a Lara's play space. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. What is, what was great about that opportunity is that that particular family, again, they were just getting started in homeschool. And so they were a little bit unsure of like, you know, how do we do this? How do we do that? And so that two day a week opportunity was a, was a great add on and a great benefit to that family as they're still new to the homeschooling game and trying to figure things out. And then it was also a great way for them to start to meet again, other families. And so that, uh, the son could begin to meet other kids. So it's just a, it's a win-win all the way around. But like I said, I love the way that Alara has it structured. I love the, the offering, you know, the two days a week. And I love that it is play-based and it is also STEM based. Um, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. And I think Alara also did a really great job of what you said, really listening to what homeschooling families need, because as you mentioned, it's play-based. She has a lot of different features in her space that people aren't going to have at home. So she has that really cool ball pit. She has gross motor structures, things that people won't have access to at home. So it's, you know, adding that physical component, that gross motor play and something that Alara does as well. I don't know if you noticed this, but for her discovery school families, she does a lot of networking events. So they do parties for the homeschool family. So yes, the kids are getting socialization and sure, you know, parents might meet or mingle at drop off and pick up, but she's actively trying to get the families together and really not just, you know, uh, saying, Hey, hello on a superficial level, but she brings the families together often throughout the year to really connect with each other on a deeper level. So that's something that I noticed as well, that I was kind of thinking about that as you were speaking throughout this episode. So I'm so glad that you brought her space up as an example. Yeah. And that's, that's a great example, a great way to build community. And that's one thing that I I've left out of all this homeschoolers are big on community. We like to feel a part of something bigger. And so if you can create, um, just like you were describing Michelle, if you can create opportunities for connection, for regular connection, and to feel a part of a, we're not just a part of the, the general, you know, homeschool community, we're a part of the homeschool community, and we meet up at this particular play space. That's a great way to kind of pull people in um, and keep them coming back regularly. And so that helps your business, but then it helps the families too, because then they, they truly feel like they are connecting and, and forming real relationships with other homeschool families. Yeah, absolutely. And from a business perspective, you know, having that drop-off program, it brings in more consistent revenue. It brings in, you know, higher ticket revenue. So it's something that is really a win-win for both the business and the community, because I know Alara has said that the Discovery School has been such a blessing to her business. She's been able to employ more people. She's been able to make a bigger impact and I love that it's making her business, again, earn that consistent recurring revenue and really be sustainable because as you said, her space is such a, a great part of her community. Absolutely. So one thing I wanted to kind of end with 
is I know you mentioned at the beginning that you right now specifically work with families of color, color when they're starting their homeschooling journey. Are there any specific challenges that families of color spa- uh, face in their homeschooling journey that we should be aware of or at least cognizant of as business owners? Yeah, so this this actually goes right into what we were just talking about. So for the reason why I focus specifically on families of color is because for us, uh, homeschool is a newer opportunity. Um, I know that when I was growing up years ago, (laughs) when I was growing up, my, my, I had lots of white friends who, um, who were homeschooled and, um, and that was, it was much more common, um, in their community fast forward a few years. And now homeschool, I think is just more accessible to a lot more people. So for example, you know, Michelle, you talked about like the stereotypical homeschool family is a stay-at-home mom and then a dad that works outside the home. And then, you know, the mom keeps the kids and is able to homeschool. And it looks very different these days. And I am a living example of how and why that looks different. I'm, I'm again, a person of color. I'm a working mom. Um, and there are, there are definitely certain things, you know, there's, there's also like you know, the things that we teach our kids and, you know, family to family, like what, what are your values? What's important to you? And so we want to make sure that we are teaching those things, but to answer your question in terms of the needs of families of color, that community piece is very, very important because again, a lot of us are so much newer to this whole concept of homeschool. And so one of the very first things that we always think about is, okay, we're making the choice to homeschool. Is there anybody else out there? (laughs) Are there any other, are there any other um, homeschool families and then specifically homeschool families of color that we can connect with? And so if you can, um, if you can offer up opportunities at your play space for whether it is a, um, because a lot of times there might be like a co-op that is, um, that is, made up of families of color, or perhaps it's a group at a church that's made up of families of color or whatever. If you go to these groups and again, and say, Hey, got a space for you. If you guys want to meet up once a month, um, or whatever that looks like. And, um, and you know, we'll just make this a regular thing. Well, you know, so that you guys have something to look forward to. And then again, from a business standpoint, so that we can see that revenue coming in, um, then let's make it happen. And, and again, that's, that's such a great way to be able to allow these families to make connections with one another. And you're just the hub. You're the, you know, you're the meeting point. So it's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And my big takeaway from that is, and a lot of these misconceptions that I went, you know, almost line by line through throughout this conversation, all of it comes down to, you know, a lot of us have this stereotypical view of the homeschooling family. And we need to work as hard as possible to break away from that because it's not reality anymore. So I'm going to ask how we can connect with you and learn more from you. But before we kind of end this conversation, are there any really good resources that you love right now where we as business owners can kind of educate ourselves a little bit more about homeschooling in general? So again, we're moving away from that stereotypical view that a lot of us may, you know, even subconsciously have about the homeschooling community? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to start with, um, again, Facebook, Facebook groups, a lot of Facebook groups that are, that are, that are offered. You don't, you don't have to be a homeschool family to be a part of, because there are lots of families who the kiddos are in traditional school, but you might just want to know more like educational, opportunities that you can use to supplement, you know, what your kids are doing in school. And so folks like that, a lot of times join these Facebook groups. I think that once you get into some of these Facebook groups, again, take a little bit to just kind of sit back and listen and to see the questions that people have, see the challenges that people have, that kind of thing. And I think you'll learn a lot just from doing that. Like, oh, okay. I never thought that that might be a challenge or, oh man, that sounds pretty cool. Like that's, that's an opportunity that, um, that I think that, you know, all kids should be able to have those kinds of, those kinds of thoughts, I think will continue to pop up and you'll be able to kind of, um, demystify some of these, some of these myths that, you know, that we think about, about traditional homeschooling. 
Um, so that's one way. Another way though, is, um, so I actually have a podcast that speaks specifically to homeschooling and homeschooling specifically for families of color. And I do a lot of this myth busting. And that's the reason why I'm bringing that up is because if you, there, there's probably a few episodes where you can literally go to and say, oh, okay. So this is a, this is a myth busting, you know, five things that, that I didn't know about, about homeschooling. And so I would say, look for opportunities like that, whether it's podcasts, um, you know, go on YouTube, maybe follow folks on Instagram. We're all out here kind of doing a lot of the same work in terms of making folks understand that homeschool is not for this necessary for this niche audience. It is very accessible. I think, especially nowadays, um, for everybody. And I think that you can learn so much just by, um, plugging into some of the folks who, who have a platform. Absolutely. And I, I think it's only going to continue becoming more accessible and more popular um, and more expansive in the future. So I think this is something that's really good to put on our list right now as business owners is to educate ourselves, listen more, um, be aware of these conversations that are happening and seek out resources like your podcast. And I will definitely link to it in the show notes or in the video description, depending if you're watching or listening. But when I was getting ready for this interview, I happened to notice a couple of your podcast reviews. And so many of them were like, wow, I had never considered homeschooling. And this is such a great resource. I would have never thought of this. So I think you're so right that kind of listening to the voices that are out there talking about homeschooling is so important for us to tune into as business owners. So we talked about your podcast, but how else can we connect with you and continue learning from you? Yeah. Well, for those of us who maybe are considering homeschool as an option, I know Michelle, you're, you fall among that camp. Um, I actually have a resource that will help you get started. It's called the homeschool beginner checklist, and you can find that at homeschoolourway.com backslash checklist. And I think it gives some good starting tips on just a lot of times the, the main question, you know, with families is how do I get started? I, I'm trying to answer some of those questions for you. So you can start there. Um, you, I do also have on my website, I have a, a page full of different kinds of learning resources. So if you're interested, if you're like, oh, okay, well, so I want, you know, my kid might be, maybe is very into, um, is very into math. And so what could, you know, what kinds of fun activities can I find for them? I have, I have, um, a page of resources like that. And that's again, homeschoolourway.com backslash resources. So you can find me there. And then I'm also on, uh, on Instagram and Michelle, I know you'll, you'll link to that in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This was such an eye-opening conversation. And I think it's so important, especially as we head into the new year so that we, again, can educate ourselves as business owners and better accommodate all the different types of customers out there. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, that wraps up my conversation with Elon Page. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you found it really helpful. And again, if you want to continue learning from Elon, I've linked all of her resources and her Instagram account in the video description. And feel free to comment if you want to talk about how you best serve homeschooling families or if you are a homeschooled family, I'd love to hear your opinion and I'd love to continue the conversation down in the comments. All right, have a great day, guys. I will see you soon.